Discover connection, awaken sacredness, come in power. Join us for our show on Blog Talk Radio. Discover your spiritual gifts live. Welcome to Discover Your Spiritual Gifts show number 66. We're your hosts, Dave and Violet. Our guest today is Sean McNamara. Sean grew up overseas and was exposed to a variety of spiritual traditions. Early incidents of illness and surgery brought about a persistent fear and contemplation of death and of what happens afterward. In his 20s, Sean became a Buddhist practitioner in order to use meditation as a way to investigate the nature of consciousness and reality, realizing that many traditions eventually become rigid and limiting out of a need for self-preservation and at the cost of each individual's unique development, he left the path he had been following. He found lucid dreaming and the out-of-body experience to be especially potent methods for his spiritual inquiry and free of the dogmatic qualities found elsewhere. He eventually applied his knowledge of meditation to telekinesis in order to illustrate the themes of interconnectedness and intention to his meditation students. Sean currently teaches meditation, remote viewing, lucid dreaming, the out-of-body experience, and telekinesis in Denver, Colorado, with the purpose of showing others that spiritual growth is still possible as an independent, self-empowering, and revelatory path. Welcome, Sean. Thank you for being on the show today. Thanks, Dave and Violet. I'm happy to be here. Well, tell us about your your early years. Uh, it sounds like you you went through some some rough times, and uh, you use those as a jumping off point for for growing. Yeah, I think what happened to me is not very special. Maybe a lot of people who are listening to this have experienced the same thing, where something happened that made them realize they were mortal. <laughs> and so, what happened for me was when I was uh, around seven years old. Um, I had an appendectomy. I had appendicitis. I didn't know what it was when my appendix got inflamed. So I had several days of extreme pain. And so the fear really started coming up. What's going on? It was the first time I had really been sick. And then I got taken to the hospital. There was surgery right away. And when I came out of it, they told me that my appendix had had burst. And I was lucky that I got there when I did. Otherwise, I'd be dead or really, really sick. And during my recovery, I, that's when I started thinking about death, my own death, and wondering about what happens afterward. And that fear and thinking about death and the afterlife persisted all, all into adulthood, where I was just haunted by it. And maybe it's just, I think it is something about experiencing something so shocking at that young age that it just stuck with me in a really particular way. And I was raised in a Catholic family and we were church going Catholics. So that I really started paying attention to what they were talking about in church and asking my own questions. And I, I think ever since I was a kid, I've been stubborn and inquisitive and I was not satisfied just being told what to believe. So I'm not criticizing the church here. I'm just saying this is my personality. It wasn't good enough to be told this is what we believe. And there's this afterlife and, you go to heaven if you're good. You go to hell if you're bad. Um, it just wasn't satisfying to me. But I wanted to know for sure if some part of me would exist after my physical body died. I just wanted some assurance. And faith on its own did not provide that assurance for me. I needed to find my own way. And I had these little reminders as I grew up about my own mortality. It's almost like the universe was noticing that I was starting to forget and it would send me a reminder. <laughs> in high school, I had a growth in my chest that got removed. And so during the few days before I got the results from the biopsy back, there's that question, is it cancer? And it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And a year after the, the lump grew back, <laughs> just to <laughs> remind me. And then in my, <laughs> in my mid-20s, I had heart surgery. And that was a big reminder of my mortality. Of course, by then I had uh, started doing my own inquiry and what I had done by then, by my mid twenties is I started practicing meditation 
with a local Buddhist group. And I had formerly become a Buddhist practitioner, which today I'm not. I don't consider myself as part of any religion formally, but I do consider myself as a spiritual practitioner. But at the, at the time, I thought, I'm going to join this group. It's attractive to me to have this meditation technique, these ways of looking at consciousness. It seems very sophisticated. Maybe I'll find my answers about the afterlife here. And so what was funny is I got prepared for my heart surgery and they were going to put me out completely, obviously, for the surgery. I thought this is a great moment to experiment and see if I can meditate before the surgery. And as I go unconscious, try and connect with my deeper self. And in in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, there's a practice called the clear light yoga, where you basically try and hold your awareness as you fall asleep or go through other transitional states as a way of touching into your deep ultimate nature. And I thought, I'll give it a shot. Even though I was very new to meditation, I was I was really taking a leap, but I thought if I can experience some part of me while I'm passed out on the operating table, that'll give me some confidence. So they gave me anesthesia, had me count down. And after counting three or four numbers, I blacked out. And the next thing that happened is I woke up after the surgery and nothing happened in between. I'd meditated beforehand, but I did not have any experience so it was a big letdown it was a big disappointment like shoot it didn't work (laughs) either i have a lot more work to do in terms of meditation and awareness or when the brain goes offline that's it and that is the full death and there is nothing afterward so it just drove me to keep looking for experiences to give me evidence one way or the other so that's how it all started um, you know, in the end, or I shouldn't say in the end, I'm just halfway through life, hopefully. At a certain point, I realized that I had gone off track because I really had forgotten about my real goal after a few years of finding out what happens after we die. Instead, my journey had been railroaded because I became more concerned with being a good practitioner of this particular Buddhist path or a good member of this particular Buddhist group, which you can do with any religion. You can follow the rules. You can study all the scriptures. You can do the practices. In the end, I found, or I'll I'll just speak for myself. I've, I found I was actually just inserting myself into this pre-designed form to look a certain way that was acceptable. And I was being measured by someone else's standards and I wasn't answering the question that I had held in my heart ever since I was a boy. This, these meditations weren't answering it. Buddhism, there are many different kinds of Buddhism, so I'm generalizing mm-hmm. here. Even though it has meditation as an experiential way to gain information, it's still very much scripture-based, tradition-based, belief-based. You know, the, it, it, everything is very firm. Everything is black and white. Everything is drawn out. Everything has been passed down generation after generation, leaving very little room for unique experiences or for coloring outside the lines, for working outside the box. And for me, I needed to start looking outside the box to find my answers. But I would have been afraid to because this tradition and the teacher I was, I was working with two different teachers, both in the end ended up being abusive. <laughs> so that's a whole other <laughs> story. But I realized, you know, I, I think I'm not really being given what I thought I would be given when I started this. And I became very jaded about religion in America in general. I mean, for a lot of people, it's, well, there are a lot of question marks there. And ironically, I've started finding my answers in non-religious ways uh, by coloring outside the lines. And I found a book. I started looking into how to have out-of-body experiences because I learned about them as a teenager. It started when I watched that 1980s movie, Out on a Limb with Shirley MacLaine. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a great made-for-TV movie. And it was so inspiring to me. There's that scene where she's in Peru in a hot springs. Right, spontaneous out-of-body experience. So when I saw that as a kid, I thought that could be my answer. And at the time, the only book I could find on it was Robert Monroe's book, Journeys Out of the Mm -hmm. Body. And he describes a technique in the book. It was written a long time ago. And the technique 
you know, that's your only option in the book. And it's not very well described. And he even acknowledges that it's difficult to understand. So I tried it. I was a teenager. I wasn't as disciplined as I am now as an adult. So it didn't go very far. But now, skip to my adulthood, being jaded with a religious approach, being reminded about my mortality, I thought, maybe I'm going to, maybe I'll try again. Let's go back to this out of body stuff. And many more books have been written in the 20 or 30 years since. Mm -hmm. And there, there are a lot more options for techniques and practices. More people are sharing their experiences. And I started off with the works of William Buhlman, who's, he, he teaches out of body experiences at the Monroe Institute. And he's written some great books and I followed his techniques. And then eventually I had my first out of body experience. And when I had it, in the moment I returned, my fear of death was completely gone. The experience was so powerful and it was extremely brief. It wasn't even a full separation. I call it a partial separation because my upper torso had extended out from my physical body, yet my legs seemed to be still glued in. But I still knew I had had the real thing, even though it was only partial. And the irony of it was I just had to train in these publicly available techniques in a book on my own. I didn't need anyone's blessing. I didn't need anyone's permission. I didn't need to feel bad that I was breaking some traditions rules. <laughs> follow the instructions that this guy openly shares. And it seems to be a universal experience. It's not the domain of any one religion. Nobody owns it because we all have consciousness and it worked. Meanwhile, I'd spent the last 20 years spending thousands of dollars on these retreats and these empowerments, getting these super secret tantric teachings <laughs> where you need the guru's blessing and permission and all this training. And then only when you reach a certain level, are you allowed to take the next empowerment for that next highest teaching? None of which go anywhere. <laughs> I'll just speak frankly to me. This is just, it's like multi-level marketing especially when it turns out that the guru is abusive and hurting people because he's got narcissistic tendencies or whatever. Like the whole thing to me, it, in my mind, fell down like a house of cards and it led nowhere. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. here's William Buhlman and hundreds of other authors who read writing modern books about consciousness exploration and they don't ask anything of you. All you have to do is put in the work, follow the instructions, feel free to experiment with them, make them work for you. And a person today can go on their own exploration freely. And so I, this set me free and having my out of body experience and the ones that followed after that gave me the confidence that I could be 100% responsible for my own spiritual growth, that I did not have to give my personal power away to another human being. And I didn't have to give thousands of dollars away anymore. <laughs> and it gave me the courage to meet with one of these teachers face to face and say, I'm done with you. I'm done with this organization. I found my own solution. Thank you for everything and goodbye. Mm -hmm. Cause I think if I hadn't had my out of body experience, some part of me would still feel dependent on that person or on that tradition, believing that they have the answers and that I needed to, give my power over to them in order to slowly get information and knowledge and experience from them with their permission. Right. So I know not all religious traditions are this way, but the one I was involved in is, you know, follows the, the guru model in the Tibetan tantric tradition. Mm -hmm. so it's very strong. There's a very strong sense of dependency between the student and the teacher. Um, and it's very hierarchical. And I got into it thinking, believing that this really led somewhere. But for me, it did not. And there are probably a, a dozen mm -hmm. different reasons why it didn't. So again, I don't mean to generalize, but I'm just speaking about my own experience. It didn't go anywhere. And then I found myself to be a, a free agent, finding new ways to explore my own consciousness, to find my own answers, all of it freely available in, in stores like yours, Violet, where people can read books on various topics and follow the instructions or meet teachers and guides who don't ask you to turn over your personal freedom to them. <laughs> so 
So I entered this land of the free search, the liberated search for information and experience. And it was, it's been wonderful. So what have you found in these experiences, Sean? Having these out-of-body experiences, how have they benefited you? What is, what have you discovered there? So, so that people kind of understand and, you know, what is that like? Mm -hmm. Well, so there are a few different lessons I've, I've learned from the experience. One is that there's some aspect of me, of us, that is not physically based. And this is something, what I found actually is that there's something in common between out-of-body experiences and other psychic phenomena like clairvoyance, precognition, telepathy. All of these involve the idea that the mind has access to information throughout the universe across space and time. And what makes all the information accessible is that we are interconnected with each other and with everything else in the world and in the universe. There's this deep, deep, deep interconnectedness. So that when I, let's say I'm having an out-of-body experience and I do the techniques and eventually I leave my body consciously, I can explore this realm, the physical realm. I can explore realms that I'm not quite sure if they exist on the physical plane, other worlds, or I could go out to outer space. But I've also had experiences, I've had one experience, for example, where I felt something that my wife was going to feel the next day. I I lived her experience in my out-of-body experience. It it involves her going down the stairs to do laundry the next day, and she cut her hand on the stairwell. Well, the night before, I had had an out-of-body experience where, for some reason, I felt drawn to go down the staircase. And in the out-of-body state, I cut my hand against the railing, except I realized I knew I was having an out-of-body experience, and I knew that I shouldn't be bleeding because I'm not in a physical body, that this was a purely mental experience. So I shook my hand off, and, of course, the wound disappeared because it was only a mental projection. And I came back to the body wondering, what was that about? And it made sense the next day when my wife, she had her laundry basket, she goes down the stairs, cuts her hand in the same spot, that I had hurt my hand the night before on the same part of the railing. And I realized this was just a little example. I had lived her experience 24 hours ahead of time in the out-of-body state. What is this about? This is about information, interpersonal sharing. You know, I, somehow I knew what was going to happen to her ahead of time, and I experienced it in the out-of-body state. I know there are a lot of complex definitions about different levels of the outer body or are using the mental body or the, the buddhic body, you know, there are different levels. I, I don't go into those. I'm not concerned with the levels, but for me, it all means that I'm connected to her and probably everybody else. And it's not just present moment, but I can connect with them in the future and into the past. There's some aspect about us that is beyond time. And it's interesting because in the out-of-body experience, it can feel like I'm out of the body for a very long, let's say 40 minutes, but I come back and it's only been a few minutes that I was actually, that my body was unconscious. So time doesn't function the same way in the out-of-body state, which is a clue. It's a hint that maybe time operates differently in different realms of experience. A lot of it has to do with how the physical brain works with time. I mean, some people have abnormalities in their brain where they move a lot slower than everybody else or a lot faster because the timing in the brain is different, which is also a clue that our experience in this world is heavily mediated by the physical brain. But some part of us can experience beyond the body, and those experiences are different. Why? Because the brain is a filter, I think a lot of people have heard this, and especially if you're into hypnosis, you might understand that the subconscious mind takes in a lot of information every moment, second by second. But the conscious mind can only perceive and utilize a very small, like 1% of all the information that we're taking in. So that means the brain has to filter out most of the information that we're 
receiving, and it just behaves consciously using 1%. But in the out-of-body experience, you're not hindered by a physical brain. So you're perceiving a lot more, seeing a lot more. And I think it's the same for someone who's clairvoyant or using precognition or other psychic abilities. They're perceiving beyond what the physical brain is doing. So they're free from that filter. So they're able to see things that the physical eyes and the physical brain cannot perceive. They're able to hear things. They're able to see things or experience things across the future and the past because the physical brain only comes into play at the very end when it's time to process that information. So if any listeners out there, you you can perceive ghosts or, or loved ones who've crossed over or you know when someone's about to call you on the phone or someone's about to text you or you trust your gut and usually your gut is right on, you know, you're perceiving things beyond the physical brain because consciousness on a deeper level is not physically based and it's interconnected with everything else in the universe. So I'm rambling here, but <laughs> so I'll, I'll pause. <laughs> Well, I, I want to ask, uh, when you're in this out of body experience state, um, what, what do you see and perceive? Is it still our reality or is it other realities? And is it significantly different or the same as, uh, an NDE experience, a near death experience? I think it's based on what I've read about NDEs because I've never had an NDE. Um, okay. So if, and there's that factor of you're almost dead or you are dead when you have an NDA. So I haven't, mm-hmm. haven't had that experience. They are different because of the quality of experience and who shows up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so just for someone who's consciously training to have an out-of-body experience, you can leave and find yourself in your own home, but it usually appears different. I've had it where the colors are very muted. Things seem gray or dark purple instead of the mm-hmm. black colors that I see. Uh, the furniture is not quite right. Uh, in one of my first ones, it was as if my apartment had been, had survived a bombing. Like the, the walls were askew. The windows, the windows were wrecked a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'm not quite sure why that happens. Part of it could be because in the out of body state, we're not using the physical eyes and brain and the physical eyes and brain have an organizing principle. They organize information in a structured way and your memory is heavily involved in that. So in the out of body state, when you're out there looking around, well, you don't have eyes in the out of body state. <laughs> you don't have a physical brain in the out of body state. It's just consciousness. And so I believe that the conscious, the deep mind is trying to recreate the experience of what your living room looks like, because that's what mentally what we're accustomed to. We're conditioned to, well, I, I just left my body. I think I'm in my bedroom. So your consciousness is trying to recreate that experience, but it's not perfect at it. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, a little bit of, it's iffy, you know, but I've also been to cities that I'm pretty sure are not on planet Earth or mm-hmm. on this type of planet Earth, maybe on a different level, where it seems where people who had been born here with us have died, and now they're in this other plane that looks very similar to ours, but it's different. Um, and I've been to outer space, but it's difficult to say. If, is it outer space on this physical plane or outer space somewhere else it's and that's the difficulty with this is that it's very subjective in fact in the out-of-body state something can happen that can happen for example in lucid dreams where your expectations or your conditioning can create things objects or beings will appear and you can't assume that they're their own independent object or, or person they might just be projections of your mind appearing in the out of body experience. So they come from you. So it's really good to have a pretty clear head, a well-trained mind when you have the out of body experience. Otherwise a lot of stuff could show up and you think it's out there that it's separate from mm-hmm. you. It's actually just part of you. So those are some of the different things that can happen. And there's also this other level, this other in between state um, where you can have encounters with beings and 
in my book, Renegade Mystic, I talk about encounters I've had with what I refer to as non-human and actually extraterrestrial beings. And I think they happened because I've been training in the out-of-body experience mm -hmm. and lucid dreams for so long that that's, that's what made it possible for me to have these encounters. And I think that they guided the encounter and they used this in-between state as a meeting place for us. So I, I would become conscious while my body was awake and suddenly I would find myself in an environment with this other being. It's hard to say, was I in my bedroom anymore? I don't think so, but was I still <laughs> physically? I don't think so either. It's just this weird liminal in-between space. And it's really hard. I mean, if one of the listeners is a scientist or a very physically minded person, they may say, you know, this, this seems iffy. This could just be all in your head. And I would understand that. It's a difficulty I've had myself with, am I making this stuff up? Or is this legit? <laughs> Is this the real thing? And I, but I take comfort in, in hearing from so many other people, not just modern people, but, you know, people across mm -hmm. different cultures that there are liminal spaces where time doesn't exist, where physicality isn't important. This dream time, you know, the Aboriginal people in Australia refer to dream time and that it's a more real place than this mm -hmm. is where we're awake. So at least there's that opening there that there are other options for how we experience each other and other beings. And it doesn't have to be that I'm standing in my living room when they show up. There's just there yeah. are other, other opportunity, other possibilities. It is difficult for me because again, I'm still a very stubborn person and I wish I could nail this all down and say for sure it's one thing or the other. <laughs> I hate the idea that I'm fooling myself or making a fool of myself. So it's still difficult for me, actually. Well, we're going to take a short break here, and we'll be right back with our guest, Sean McNamara. Hi, I'm Violet Rain, Master Teacher of the Akashic Records series of classes here at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts. If you've been interested in the Akashic Records, the Akashic Records are the life book or the etheric records of everything that we've ever thought, spoken, done, all of our contracts, relationships since we left Source. It is a valuable resource of information that people are able to tap into to get Get clarity to get guidance just to find out why things are the way they are in their life. The Akashic really helps us do that. This is a great series of classes if you're already getting intuitive information, meaning you're either getting visuals or you're hearing things or you just know things or you feel things. This is a great class to step into to amplify the information that you're receiving from a higher level of source versus just your intuition. If you'd like to find out more about my series of classes for the Akashic Records, please check out on our website under classes and look for Akashic Record Certification. I hope to see you in class or I hope to see you at the center here at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts. Have a great day and thanks for listening. Well, welcome back to Discover Your Spiritual Gifts. Our guest today is Sean McNamara, talking about out-of-body experiences and lots of uh, other interesting aspects of that. So I've, I've got to ask you, you know, we, we've had so many uh, movies, which I think are implanted in people's brains for the themes to uh, help us be open to things in advance, where um, it brings into question whether our reality is actually real. And... Uh, I kind of lean towards the idea that we we all kind of co-create a reality, um, but it's uh, it's it's a convenience for us, and we all agree that the tree is there because we can all walk up and touch the tree. Uh, that still is not convincing to me that the tree is there. I go back to the ancient Greeks who started a, a puzzle for us, and we've never answered it completely where we have no objective way of proving that reality exists out there because uh, in our, in our instance, uh, signals come in through our eyes. Uh, we get visual images, they get converted to chemical and electrical signals. They end up in the brain and they get processed there. 
and the brain puts them into a context or into a space that we can think what we see out there is what we're actually experiencing. And only because we seem to have agreement uh, do we all concur, you know, but still, you know, are we more like the matrix where we're plugged into a, a computer or, a, you know, a spiritual thing that uh, gives us all that same framework to deal with. And so I just wonder if in your explorations, uh, sort of where are you going uh, in terms of, you know, knock on wood, you know, our reality versus the realities you experience in the OBE? And um, have you had experiences where you come back with objective evidence that you have been somewhere else or spoken to somebody or things like that? Yeah, well, that, I mean, all of that comes down to it's the million dollar question. Is <laughs> <laughs> real? What is and real? I, yeah, not real. Is this real? I think it's a really important question because it's highly emotional. If I think anyone who contemplates that question deeply, it's emotional because how much do things really matter in the end? It can become an exist, existential question, and it can yeah. actually to a sense of depression or hope, whichever way you lean that it can get pretty extreme. Mm-hmm. And I felt those extremities too. Like, does anything really matter then if that tree isn't really there? Mm-hmm. And that's a danger actually in different spiritual or religious traditions. Um, for example, in, you know, some of the traditions I've been involved in, there's this idea that everything is empty of, of objective reality right. and nothing really matters. But then at the same time they say, but still, People who don't know that, which is most everybody, they still suffer. <laughs> they still mm-hmm. have to do work and do the things that humans do, and it's it's painful. And there's also joy there, and it shouldn't be discounted. The joy and happiness of being alive shouldn't be discounted. And some some people can go to an extreme and say, well, it really doesn't all matter, and then they take on the behaviors of an anti someone with antisocial personality, mm-hmm. very ni- very nihilistic, yeah. You know. Nihilistic, you know, the yeah. rules don't change to them anymore. The social constructs, they can just hurt anyone they want to. It's all emptiness anyway. It doesn't matter. So that's an extreme way people can take this, which I don't think is right. I, you know, nobody really thinks mm-hmm. it's right. Um, it's funny that you mentioned the matrix, uh, because when you, when you said that, I was thinking about how the body, the physical body in the brain is like a vehicle for non-physical consciousness. And it's a vehicle for experiencing this realm. Let's just say planet Earth on today's date, right now, this moment, the physical reality, our body is the vehicle that the conscious mind is inhabiting um, throughout the day <laughs> to different degrees Mm -hmm. that even within this physical reality there are different different levels of awareness for so let's just say the way you and i right now we're looking at each other on the screen we're talking we're in our physical bodies it's actually just one type of altered state of awareness that we're perceiving each other this way and we call it being wide awake Mm -hmm. uh but what if you're drunk what if you are doing ayahuasca? What if, what if you're doing, um, some other type of hallucinogenic drug or medicine? You're going to experience other realms. You're going to have encounters with people, uh, who are not here physically in the dream state. That's an altered state of consciousness. The out of body state is an altered state of consciousness. And I could go on. Meditation is another one. Um, in the moment of having an orgasm, if you watch the mental state, that's another state of consciousness. Uh, so I don't think there is an objective reality. That was all a long way to say there's no objective. Mm-hmm. Reality. Yeah. There, it's just very, it's the variety package that we've all signed into and it's a gift. I think the biggest gift is though to have this human body because even though it's temporary, you know, on average between 75 to 85 years we get in our bodies, if all mm-hmm. goes, 
uh, it's temporary, but it's very solid. It's very constant. So as a vehicle for learning about reality and about life, it's a beautiful gift because we can all walk up to the tree and call it a tree at the same time. And we generally have the same experience. So if we consider life on this planet, on the physical plane, as a classroom, a place to learn, it's a beautiful one because of the stability that physicality offers. We can learn our lessons because of all the limitations to having a body and a brain have. have. For example, being worried about dying drives us to investigate. It drives us to become spiritual people. Uh, going through the extremes of uh, puberty as a teenager and how that drives us crazy, we learn a lot there. When we lose people we love to death, we learn about love even more. We learn about letting go. When we fall in love with someone as an adult and commit to them to some degree of time, either through marriage or other ways of partnership, there's learning that goes by making commitments that way. And if we didn't have a stable experience of being alive in these bodies, if we were just little blips of consciousness appearing and reappearing in different parts of the universe, we wouldn't be able to form a personal history, at least in one lifetime. And history is what lets us reflect back on ourselves and to learn. I didn't want to say it earlier, but I'll say it now that perhaps the most important lesson I learned from out-of-body experiences and the other psychic abilities is how much having a body in a physical life, how much of it is a gift. And at a certain point, I stopped training to have out-of-body experiences because to do my training, the, the methods I preserve, prefer, excuse me, preferred, I would have to leave my bed in the middle of the night to go train. For me, the middle of the night is a, is a great time for this training. I'd go to the living room and either lay on the floor or the couch or massage table and do the techniques to leave the body. But to do that meant I had to go, I had to leave my wife, leave her in bed. And after a certain number of out-of-body experiences, a certain number of time, I realized I'm going to be a non-physical entity for eternity, perhaps, or for as long as the universe lasts. But to be Sean in this body with my wife, Sierra, I only have a few years and I think I'd rather experience laying in bed next to my wife while I can and worry about the out-of-body stuff when I'm dead. <laughs> Save the rest of my head. And it's not, I don't think it's not it's so much about attachment to my wife or being physical, but it's realizing the lessons and the experiences that we have. We have a lim- limited amount of time to have these experiences in the grand scheme of things compared mm-hmm to the age of the universe and to what could be the age of our non-physical consciousnesses. So I've stopped years ago, actually, because I've been married seven years now, but so years ago I stopped training to actively have out-of-body experience. Every, although every once in a while they happen spontaneously for whatever reason. Um, but so the biggest lesson I've had from all of this is that, wow, what a gift to have a human body and a brain to be in this life, in this time. Um, it's just such a gift. And and I don't want to skip to the back of the book where all the answers are, which is what a lot of psychic abilities do. <laughs> hey, by the way, we're in a matrix. <laughs> so, you know what? I, yep. I would rather not be too worried about the matrix and just be a bumbling, confused human trying my best not to screw anybody up, not to cause too many problems. And when I do learn from my mistakes and try and do my best just as a regular human person, because I think that's when the biggest lessons are learned for me. Although I still teach some of these abilities to people. I have a local group of friends here in Denver. We do activities together exploring psychic phenomena because it, it serves as a reminder, you know, so to not get too far into the physical thing, to, we are more than we think we are. Mm-hmm. That's a gift too, because it's nice to remember that we're special. And I don't mean that in an egotistical way. I just mean we're not, you know, we're more than meets the eye. 
Mm -hmm. To remember that we're interconnected to each other. It's a gateway to compassion and to connection and to responsibility to others and to the planet Earth, too. Because if this is our classroom, we have to preserve this classroom for future generations. You know, some people are out there thinking we need to get to Mars or to other planets as soon as possible because this planet's going to be over with. It won't be usable anymore. That is probably one of the biggest crimes in the universe to throw away our planet Earth because we think there's a substitute out there for us. You know, I I don't know about you, but I don't want to end up on some, or I don't want future generations to end up in some enclosed space on a dead planet. Yeah. That's a terrible classroom. I like being able to go to the beach and look at the waves. I love being able to go snowboarding, Mm -hmm. play in the snow and dance under the rain and walk through the reservoir and go on hikes in the mountains. You can't do that on Mars or on the moon or on whatever other planets. So this is a golden opportunity to be a human on planet earth. Mm -hmm. And I think realizing our interconnectedness and the value of being alive adds that value to this planet. And so we all realize more this responsibility we have. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of a downer. <laughs> what responsibility come <laughs> with consciousness exploration? Well, I, I I think so, at least for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about your books and your online courses and some of the things that you offer, Sean. That for the listeners out there that might be even more curious to find out more about these topics. Yeah, thanks for that, Violet. I I love teaching anything to anybody it's just one of my call just to share i like sharing and after i had my out body experience i realized how valuable it was for me to remove my fear of death and i thought i want to give other people that option i want to contribute to this field of consciousness exploration so i started writing books uh the first book i wrote was about telekinesis it's called the fire limits and telekinesis is mind over matter and it's just another way of exploring the notion that we are interconnected with our world and with reality. So if you can move or affect an object from a distance using consciousness, that means there's something moving across space and time to contact the object. So I wrote that book and Meditation X is another telekinesis book. Then um, I also wrote Signal and Noise, which is an, a training book for remote viewing and clairvoyance and ESP. And it has tons of exercises in it. And it tracks a journey I went on with my friends here in Denver using remote viewing for various experiments, including using it to predict the pick three lottery here in Colorado. We won it twice using remote viewing in 2019. And it shows <laughs> signal and noise shows you exactly how we set up the experiment and it shows you the drawings and the pictures and the process all the viewers went through to win the the lottery twice. And you can follow along doing the exercises. So training your mind with that. The one, the closest to my heart that is probably the least popular for some reason, it's, it's called Renegade Mystic and it's about my personal journey. And it's really intimate uh, because it goes into my you know, the fear of death that I went through and goes into detail about mistakes I have made along the way and what happened when I was in these spiritual groups and what the abuse was like that I and others went through and then goes into learning about psychic abilities and the experiences that I had and into pretty graphic detail about the encounters I had with non-physical beings. And so it's like a it's like a longitudinal study of my life, but I share it because I think I'm definitely not alone in these experiences. And it's a way of letting people know you're not crazy. This happened to me. And if it happened to you, that's okay. And there is light at the end of the tunnel and there are benefits to these experiences. It doesn't mean that you're losing your mind. So that one's dear to my heart, obviously, because it's part of me. It's very personal. It's about my life, but the title Renegade Mystic isn't necessarily about me. It's it's about anyone who's out there finding answers for themselves and they're willing to rock the boat. They're willing to go against the grain. It's for all the black sheep 
out there. If you're black. <laughs> there's there's lots of those. Absolutely. <laughs> you, are the, you are the renegade mystics. You're willing to counter what most people take for granted or the people would rather just believe you're not. You're willing to challenge what most people think and go your own way. So I wrote mm-hmm. that book for those people. And then my most recent book is called Mindsight. I don't know if you saw the movie Superhuman, The Invisible Made Visible hmm. by Caroline Corey. It's on, it's on, um, Amazon. It's on a bunch of different platforms, but there's this about half of it is about those kids who are wearing blindfolds who can, uh, read while they're blindfolded, they can see colors, they can play games with each other. Well, adults can do this too. And I started exploring it myself, teaching mm-hmm. myself how to do it. And then I wrote this book called Mindsight. It is a step-by-step training program for adults to learn how to see without using their physical eyes. And it's based off all the training I've done and other psychic abilities. I put it all together. It's based on my own experiences. And it also lists the mistakes I made along the way so that you don't repeat those mistakes. And it's so a person can learn by themselves using this book. Although you can also apply it to work with a partner or with a group because there are Facebook groups out there where you can find a partner to train with or groups to train with. But many of us are very private and would rather train on our own time alone. Mm-hmm. Mindsight shows you exactly how to do that. And it's not a fast process. It can take years um, unless you're fortunate. So because the adult brain is pretty fixed compared to mm-hmm. the child's brain. But basically my goal for all my books and some of the online courses are on the same material. My goal is to give people the option if they want to explore for their own benefit, that here's, here's some resources they can use to realize their deeper nature. And hopefully it brings them happiness and release from fear and a deeper understanding about their interconnectedness with the people in their life and with the planet. I think the older I get, the more concerned I get about the planet and society. Yeah. It's part of, part of growing up. And I think for the right people, exploring consciousness gives them an edge on finding solutions because consciousness exploration can make a person more creative. They can be more apt to receive inspirational information from other sources you know, there's so many people in history like um, Tesla and others who received information in the liminal state. Inventors come up with ideas in the ha- mm-hmm. state. So I think there's a practical value here. If you explore your own psychic abilities, you're going to be a more creative person. You're going to come up with novel solutions to modern problems. If you're an engineer or a doctor, biologist, you're going to find solutions to the next pandemic, Mm -hmm. how to filter water better, how to grow crops faster, better in a healthy way. I think people who explore consciousness will have the answers to the future problems and questions we'll have as a society. So hopefully some of the people I touch through my books and online courses, they're tomorrow's doctors and physicists and engineers and chemists and counselors and therapists. So hopefully. Well, I, I've had, uh, as an electrical engineer working in aerospace, I've, I've had fascinating insights where I had those aha moments and, uh, you know, found the, the secret sauce to make something work or to, to solve something where it wasn't working right. Uh, things like that. And, uh, so that, that's come to me and just, uh, it's wow. You know, I didn't get there by logical process. Uh, I got there by a, a flash of insight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's the, you're an example. You're a perfect example of someone who's well educated, intelligent in a physical science, but also open to the soft side of life. The, the, non-objective to inspiration and your gut and things that come to you in the middle of the night, mm-hmm. you're like the best of both worlds. So there, there's a lot of practical value there. 
I saw that on your profile. You're, you're an actual rocket scientist. It's yeah. So yeah. Cool. <laughs> so into my next phase of my life doing all this, I, I've been working in this since 1983, but always on the side. And then in the past five years, I've transitioned over to uh, making this full time. And so I, I do a lot of work with a lot of people too in, in various aspects. Um, so your website is www mindpossible.com. That's an easy one to remember for people. And uh, you have a wonderful group of books there. You have the details about your training and resources. Um, is there anything else that people should be aware about using your website to, to reach you or reach your services? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if they go over to the, the menu, there's a contact page that they can use to contact me if they'd like to. Um I'm teaching less often these days, but if someone has a really deep question or if they're struggling with anything, they can reach out to me and I can at least send them to someone who can be more helpful. And my books are available at the store. So come by the store and maybe in the springtime, uh, we'll do a book signing there. But, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah, we would love to have you. We'd love to set that up where people could come in and meet and chat with you we like to do book signings on the weekend because we have more traffic and that way we got people coming in and going so it would be lovely to have that and it's it's awesome that you're right here locally yeah denver is a really great place because there are a lot of like-minded people here doing the exploration and you know at the store you've got so many practitioners there that people can go to for healing and guidance and You've got some great meeting rooms there too available for people who want to offer their services. So, um, you know, you, people tend to think of California as the place to go for these kinds of explorations, but I think Denver's got something going on for at least the middle <laughs> part of the country. We've really got something here. So. I, I think we're light worker central extending from Pueblo to Fort Collins. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, in this area, people don't, if you say, well, I think your second chakra needs adjustment, they don't turn around and say, what's a chakra? <laughs> right. You, you know, in Wichita, they would. <laughs> well, that's where I, that's where I grew up. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a wonderful place to be, uh, investigating all these, uh, spiritual gifts. I think it's a great, great area. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're, uh, go wrap it up for today. Uh, thank you again, Sean, for, for being with us and uh, sharing your time and your, your views. Uh, you, you've had a, a fun life, a very interesting life. So that's great. Well, great to chat with you. Thank you so much, Violet and Dave. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to this show. And please stay with the show. We'll have some messages from several of our practitioners, and those are always interesting. You take care and have a great week. I am Lisa Laney two-time international best-selling author, teacher, intuitive artist, reader, and healer at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts. I am a very creative, artistic person who has been an intuitive empath my whole life. As a child, I was always aware of energy. I could detect shifts as people entered the room, which I thought all people could do. I didn't realize I was an empath until much later in life. I have studied various modalities, attended several retreats to peel back layers of childhood experiences to create a toolbox I use to navigate this world with intention. I am now pairing my intuitive gifts with my creativity to live an intentional life and empower other women to shine their brightest light, to manifest an abundant life with creativity and intention. If this resonates with you, join me at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts the first Thursday of each month at 6.30 at my Women's Intention Play Shop. The focus of each class varies on a different intention to heal, inspire, and empower each of you with a simple art project. In this class, we set the intention into what you create, so when you bring it home, you are reminded of what you are manifesting or releasing each time you look at it. This keeps the energy moving, which helps you create a more empowered version of yourself. If you prefer one-on-one time, I offer intuitive tree readings. You simply draw me a tree any way you feel guided. Coupled with your intention, we edit the tree so you have a visual of how you want to create a life of joyous empowerment. If this is calling you, I can be reached at 720-257-9441 or at lisaelaney.com. 
Tap into your inner magic to create an amazing toolbox of your own by joining me, Lisa Laney, at Discover Your Spiritual Gift. Hi, my name is Heather Nichols. I'm a soul journey coach and the owner of Soulful Essence and Wellbeing. For the past several years, I've been on a quest to fulfill my full purpose of healing my past so I may learn to love myself unconditionally. I want to show others how they can do the same thing for themselves. My journey officially began in 2015. I became a Reiki master teacher to be a conduit of healing for myself and others. And I've always had an interest in hypnosis and self-development. And I finally stepped forward in my passion and found a program that helped me release negative emotions that were keeping me stuck in my past. I became a certified practitioner in this wonderful program and later studied Akashic Records and many other healing modalities. I'm beginning my new class series starting in March, and this class is for people who are ready to release emotional trauma and blocks from their past. This can be from past lives or this life. During this class, we'll explore what impact anger, sadness, fear, hurt, and guilt has in our lives, how we react to people in situations because of our state of mind, why it's important to forgive ourselves and others, then it's time to release. And we'll use time techniques to release anger and sadness, a guided meditation to release additional negative emotions, and I'll be giving you a workbook so that you can journal about your experiences. The class schedule is from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on the following days. Saturday, March 14th. Saturday, April 11th. Sunday, May 24th. Saturday, June 13th, Sunday, July 19th, Saturday, August 15th. And you can register at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts, Facebook, Meetup, or Eventbrite, or at Soulful Essence and Wellbeing on Facebook. You can also register on my website at Soulful Essence, the letter N, wellbeing.com forward slash classes. I look forward to seeing you in my class. Uh, hi, I'm Nikki Milton. I am the center manager and marketing manager here at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts. I'm here two days a week on Mondays and Fridays, marketing this beautiful center and um, making sure that the center is up to standard for all you lovely guests who will hopefully come and visit us soon. I also own a content marketing agency, so I'm a teacher here in the space because I have a real passion for helping the spiritual business owners in this community learn how to brand and market their businesses. So I run a business class series every year on branding and marketing and social media classes, as well as a full strategy workshop towards the end of the year to help you get your business in line for for the upcoming year. And that is what I do here at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts. Discover Connection Awaken Sacredness Join us for our show on Blog Talk Radio. 